You've probably heard a lot about the controlling idea in your English courses here in high school. I often find, though, that students don't exactly have clarity about what the controlling idea is or how to craft a strong one. So this video is meant to clarify all of those aspects of the controlling idea. The first most important thing to remember about the CI is, is that it is the most essential element of any successful argumentative essay. The goal of every essay is to prove the controlling idea. That's such a foundational idea that I want to repeat it. The goal of every single essay and every part of your essay, from your topic sentences to your concrete details down to your commentary, is to prove the controlling idea. It is the kernel upon which the rest of your essay is built. So hopefully this video will help to clarify everything about the controlling idea. And I also hope that you'll see that this discussion of the CI isn't just about essay writing. It's ultimately about how to approach thinking about literature in an argumentative way. And I think that by approaching literature as a battleground of ideas, as opposed to just plot points and characters, it should make consuming stories a lot more engaging and interesting. So here are the three standards for the controlling idea. It has to be these three things in order to be strong. First is argumentative, second is beyond the text, and third is narrow and specific. And the rest of this video will be breaking down the definitions of each of these three standards and giving you examples to test whether or not you understand them. So let's start with argumentative. In order for a controlling idea to be argumentative, it must have a debatable claim, something that two reasonable people could take opposing sides on and debate. So that means that it cannot be plot summary and you cannot just state facts. Hopefully this standard should be very easy for you to understand. I think it's easy to identify plot summary versus argumentation. But let's take a look at some examples just to make sure. So is this CI argumentative? In Steven Spielberg's Jaws, a giant shark terrorizes a nice beach community. Hopefully, even if you haven't seen Jaws, you know enough just from the movie poster to know that this is not argumentative. This is just plot summary, right? Jaws is literally about a giant shark that terrorizes a beach community. There's nothing to debate here that is just the plot level premise of the film. Let's go to this next one. Is this one argumentative? In Jaws, Steven Spielberg conveys that fear of the unknown can only be conquered through courage. Hopefully you immediately see the difference. Whereas the last one was just summarizing the plot, this one is clearly making an argument about how to conquer fear of the unknown. That's a debatable claim. We could have a debate about how to best conquer the unknown or how to best overcome one's fear of the unknown. Um, and that would be, that's obviously an argumentative statement. Now, there are two types of argumentative claims, and I think these two terms will really help you to get a little bit more specific about how to think of argumentation. Almost every single argument, 10 out of 10 times, can fit into these two buckets. The first is a causal claim, which is a claim of cause and effect. That's the idea that some X variable causes or leads to some Y variable, which is the effect. And second is a value judgment, and that's asserting that something is good or bad. Now let's look at some examples to make this a little bit more concrete. So is this claim a causal claim or a value judgment? Eating pizza leads to immense happiness. Hopefully you can see here that this is a causal claim. Eating pizza is the X variable, and that X variable of putting pizza into your body leads to the effect, which is the Y variable, in this case, immense happiness. So hopefully you can see there the cause and effect relationship between those two variables of eating pizza and immense happiness. That's what cause and effect claims are. The second type of claim that you can make is called a value judgment. And let's see uh, what that looks like. Pizza is one of the worst foods known to humanity. So clearly this isn't a cause and effect claim. There aren't two variables here. Instead, this is just asserting that pizza is bad. That's a value judgment. And hopefully both of these types of claims should feel familiar to you. You make them all of the time, um, but I'm just giving you the exact terminology here. Every single claim that you can make about literature can fall into these two, uh, into these two buckets, these two terms. Let's take a look at another. Is this a causal claim or a value judgment? Pizza is a food with many ingredients. Hopefully, as you're sitting here, you should be scratching the stubble on your chin because it is neither a causal claim or a value judgment. And I think this is a good example that helps to prove the idea that if you test your sentences, your controlling ideas, and ask yourself, is this a causal claim or is this a value judgment? And the answer is neither. 
then you know that you do not have an argumentative claim. This sentence is just a statement of fact. There's nothing debatable here. Pizza is indeed a food with many ingredients. There's no stand that anybody could take to oppose this. This is just a statement of fact. It is neither a causal claim or a value judgment. And what I strongly urge you to do when you're crafting your own controlling ideas is to ask yourself the same question. Is my sentence a causal claim or a value judgment? Not only will this help to clarify for you what type of claim you are making, it will also help to prevent this type of situation where you realize, "Uh uh-oh, I am just summarizing the plot here. Let's look at another example. Totalitarianism is the most dangerous form of government. Is this a causal claim or a value judgment? And as we go through these examples in the video, I strongly urge you to pause the video, think on it for a second, come up with your own answer, and then see if you got it right or not. So let's look at this example. Is this causal claim or value judgment? Clearly, this is a value judgment. There's no cause and effect relationship here. Totalitarianism isn't leading to anything. This is just offering a judgment on the value of totalitarianism. And clearly, it comes to the conclusion that it is bad. Even though it doesn't use the word good or bad within this particular sentence, it's clear that the value judgment here is arguing that totalitarianism is bad. It's asserting that it is wrong. Next. Avoiding hardship prevents one from growing. Is this a causal claim or a value judgment? It's a causal claim. There are two variables, avoiding hardship, and what does that do? That leads to preventing one from growing. So notice that the language of leading to or causing isn't present within this particular sentence, but nevertheless, it is a cause and effect claim, right? If something causes something else to stop or to uh, discontinue, then that is still a cause and effect relationship. And here, avoiding hardship is preventing one from growing. So you can see the cause and effect between the X variable of avoiding hardship and the Y variable of preventing one from growing. Let's take a look at one more example. One should not treat people as a means to an end. Causal claim or value judgment. Hopefully, again, uh, you can notice that this is a value judgment. There are no cause and effect relationships here. And a great word that really cues you to that is should. Any statement that has should in it is almost always making a judgment on some sort of value. If I say you should do your homework, that is making a value judgment that doing your homework is good. You should eat salads. That, again, is asserting that eating salads is good. That's very different than a causal claim, like if I said doing homework allows a student to succeed. That is a cause and effect relationship, that doing homework is correlated and linked to success. But here, you can see that should statements are about value judgments. And saying that one should not treat people as a means to an end is asserting that that idea of treating people as a means to an end is wrong. One should not do it. Let's go to the second standard, beyond the text. And if you've never heard this term before, it can sound very foreign. So let's break it down. The idea of making your claim beyond the text is making sure that you are abstracting it beyond the characters and plot, so that you're not making an argument about particular characters or about particular plot points. Instead, you're abstracting those characters and those plot points to make an idea or to make an argument about a higher idea or concept. So this is going beyond the text and making it so that your claim is fundamentally about deeper truths as a pertain to the human condition. Typically, those can be philosophical or ethical or psychological, but nevertheless, you know you have a beyond-the-text argument when you when your claim could be applied universally to all of humanity as opposed to just your specific text. Let's take a look at some examples. Do you think this is beyond the text or not? The film Infinity War conveys the dangers of characters like Thanos, who use Infinity Stones to murder people in the name of achieving balance in the universe. Now hopefully you can see here that this is indeed argumentative, right? It's a value judgment. It's saying that using Infinity Stones to murder people in the name of achieving balance is wrong. It's dangerous. You shouldn't do it. So that checks off our first standard. But as for beyond the text, Hopefully you can notice here that this isn't abstracting a claim about a higher idea or concept. This is just talking about the characters and plot points within Infinity War. The reality is that in the world we live in, we don't have Infinity Stones that I can put on my fingers and then snap my uh, fingers and make half of all of life disappear. That just doesn't exist. So this thesis is not beyond the text. It's not abstracting any claims about higher ideas and concepts. It's just making arguments about the characters and plot points within this film. 
In general, if you have characters or plot points within your CI, that is a clear red flag that you probably are not beyond the text. For almost every CI within our class, you should not have any characters mentioned. All you should mention is the film or text name and argue how that proves a higher idea or concept. Let's take a look at another example. Is the CI beyond the text? The film Infinity War conveys the dangers of treating individuals as a means to an end in the name of achieving a larger goal. Hopefully you see how different this one is. Even though it's addressing the same idea of the first one, this CI is articulated in a way that's abstracted beyond the text. Not only does this make claims more interesting, because now you're not just talking about particular characters, now you're actually talking about ideas that could relate to other situations within your own life, I also think it'll really help you in your essay. Why? Because in the first example, when you're talking about Thanos, the danger of dangers is that within your commentary, in your analysis, in your body paragraphs, if all you're connecting your analysis to is the idea that Thanos is using his Infinity Stones to hurt people, well, you might slip into plot summary really quickly. And plot summary is what you want to avoid at all costs. By abstracting your controlling idea to a higher idea or concept, that makes it so that it is almost impossible to do pure plot summary if you're truly trying to link to your CI, because every bit of your analysis will be moving from the concrete examples that you weave into your concrete details to this beyond the text idea, and that inherently forces you to start making arguments that go beyond the text. So it will save you from doing plot summary, which will really help, I think, your argumentation. Let's take a look at some more examples. Is a CI beyond the text? In Herman Melville's Moby Dick, Captain Ahab's obsession with Moby Dick leads to his own destruction. So the great thing about these standards is that even if you've never read the texts, you can immediately identify whether or not it meets our core criteria. And in this particular case, you can see the red flags immediately. This is not beyond the text. This is an argument about Captain Ahab and his obsession with Moby Dick, which are clearly characters and plot points within the novel. And so this is not beyond the text. Now notice that this thesis has the kernel of a beyond the text idea, right? This thesis could very easily transform and be abstracted to make an argument about the dangers of obsession more broadly. What are the dangers of when people obsess about singular things too much? But it's not phrased in that beyond the text way, and so therefore it does not meet our criteria. Next. In Dark Side of the Moon, the band Pink Floyd argues that embracing the mysterious nature of reality will lead to enlightenment. Is this beyond the text? Hopefully you answered yes, because it is beyond the text. There's nothing about characters or plot points here. This is an argument about a higher idea or concept about how to best become enlightened as an individual. And clearly, uh, this meets our criteria. Let's go to our third one, narrow and specific. Ironically enough, this standard about being narrow and specific is the Vegas. Um, it's harder to define in a binary way like the other ones, but nevertheless, let's try. So, narrow and specific is all about avoiding unnecessary vagueness. And a good way to test that is to see whether the reader has to ask a question to understand the CI. Um, oftentimes, writers, especially high school students, will leave their CI so vague that it's not at all clear what you're arguing. So let's take a look at some examples to see what I mean here. Is this narrow and specific? The film, in the, the film Star Wars A New Hope, or in the film Star Wars A New Hope, George Lucas argues what it takes for one to become a hero. Now, do you understand this argument right off the bat, or do you have to ask a question to understand what this means? Hopefully you can notice that something isn't quite clarified here. The question you should be asking is, wait a second, what does it take for one to become a hero? This CI does not clarify what it actually takes for one to become a hero, and so it remains really vague. Does becoming a hero require you to be selfless? Does becoming a hero require you to work hard? Does becoming a hero require you to put yourself in great danger? What does it mean to become a hero? It's not clear, and so this CI isn't actually narrow and specific. It's quite vague. We don't know really what it's arguing, and that vagueness will lead to lots of problems within your body paragraph. Let's take a look at this example. The film Star Wars A New Hope, George Lucas argues that one should become a hero by listening to one's conscience. 
Hopefully you see the difference, right? This is clearly narrow and specific. It identifies exactly what it takes to become a hero. One should become a hero by listening to one's conscience. No longer is there that vagueness that existed in the last example, where it wasn't clear what it actually takes to become a hero. Here, it is clearly defined, and so this CI is narrow and specific. Next example. In the novel 1984, George Orwell conveys what happens in a society of surveillance and totalitarianism. Is this narrow and specific? No. Again, you're asking the exact same question as that first example we looked at here, where you're scratching your head and wondering, well, what does happen in a society of surveillance and totalitarianism? Notice how vague this CI is. Wonderful things might happen in a society of totalitarianism, or horrible things might happen. But the important thing is that from this CI, you don't know. And you don't want to keep your reader in anticipation of what you're ultimately going to argue. It will make it unclear both for yourself and the reader what the essay is ultimately trying to prove, which is bad writing. Next. The television and video game series Pokemon conveys the steps to become successful. Is this narrow and specific? The answer is no. Now, this one oftentimes trips up students because they become used to this standard having a word like what in the CI to cue you into the fact that it's vague. But here, hopefully, you'll see that it's the exact same type of vagueness, right? What are the steps to become successful? It's not clear. Again, it could be a multitude of different types of steps. It could be hard work. It could be, uh, it could be resiliency. It could be about courage. It's not clear what it takes to be successful based on this particular CI, which makes it vague. So even if you don't have that what word in there that cues you to immediately know that it's not narrow and specific, you can still write CIs that are vague. So let's take another look um, at a final CI. Game of Thrones conveys that an obsession with attaining power often causes one to abandon their, moral, their morals. Is this narrow and specific? Yes. This is, a clear, uh, this is a clear cause and effect claim, a causal claim. It is beyond the text and is very clear about what it's arguing. It doesn't leave anything ambiguous or vague. You understand exactly what causes one to abandon their morals. Right? The vague version of the CI would be Game of Thrones conveys what causes one to abandon their morals. Or Game of Thrones conveys the, step that, the steps that lead one to abandon their morals. Both of those versions of the CI don't make it clear what causes one to abandon their morals, but this CI does. So hopefully, these examples have helped you to understand the core components of the controlling idea. If you have more questions, feel free to reach out. I'd be more than happy to clarify anything else.